So on Sunday, um, June 25th, 1967, during a live televised broadcast, the Beatles performed a song for a program called Our World. It was a, a program that was developed by the BBC and the intention was to gather as many countries as possible to, to hear positive messages, kind of uniting messages from a global scale. The audience was estimated to be somewhere around 400 to 700 million people. And the Beatles were tasked with writing a song for the event. Something simple, something positive, something that would be easily translated. And so they wrote the song, All You Need Is Love. That was the first time that it was um, uh, displayed before an audience. Brian Epstein said, their manager, they really wanted to give the world a positive message. The nice thing about the song is that it cannot be misinterpreted. It's a clear message saying that love is everything. The problem is it doesn't define love. And remember, this was 1967, June of 1967, and this was the beginning of the summer of love. Young people gathered together in San Francisco Junior hires, high schoolers, college students, over 100,000 people from all over the country gathered together at Haight-Ashbury and they had free food, free lodging, free medical care, free music, and of course, free drugs, free sex, and they called it free love. One person who was there said it was as simple as walking out your front door and then the party began. And of course, it lasted from June all the way through September. Now, the people that went were looking for something, but what they got was something far less than what they had hoped for. The highs, of course, wore off. The consequences of the drugs and the alcohol. Of course, the consequences of the free sex. They said STDs were such a huge problem that when someone asked, were sexually transmitted diseases a problem at the end of the summer of love, they said in September, that would be like asking if a hurricane had a wind. It was a huge, huge issue. And with it, of course, many unwanted pregnancies and of course, many abortions. There's a line from the movie Jesus Revolution that we're gonna see this week. It's about what God did as a response to all these things that were going on in the world and how God showed up and showed a strong hand on behalf of that generation. This line in the movie really struck me and it's stuck with me ever since I saw the movie. The person said, they're searching for all the right things in all the wrong places. And I just can't shake that, that phrase because they were, they were searching for all the right things in all the wrong places. They wanted a sense of belonging. They were looking for relationships, many of them in fractured homes, many of them runaways. They were searching for love. They just didn't know what love is. And the same thing is true today because we can look at the world we live in and we can say that things are worse than they've ever been, but let's be honest, things have been worse many times in our whole world's history. But we can get so focused on what we've experienced just in our country in our days and of course, things are bad. And in some ways, in some areas, things are different in a bad way than they've ever been. But God's big. God's still on the throne. And he has a heart for people. And there's a reason why we're here on planet Earth. You see, I believe with all my heart that we have two very simple purposes. Number one, the reason why we're here is to get ready to go to heaven. Amen? Amen. The second reason is to take as many people with us as we possibly can. And that is the simple reason why we're alive here on planet Earth. And the people that we see on the outside so often can be mocked and so often can be turned off by the attitude within the church when the church fails to see them like they saw them at the Jesus movement. They're searching for all the right things in all the wrong places. It's true today. We have all sorts of people that are searching for all the right things in all the wrong places. They want relationship, they want connection. That's why social media is so popular. 
I mean, social media is not going anywhere. And when you look at the popularity of social media, whether it's, you know, Facebook, if you're older, they say, or if it's Instagram, if you're younger, the reality is all the forms of social media point to something. Though it can be annoying, though it can be obnoxious, we don't need to see what you had for dinner last night. Okay? One thing that's definitely true is this. People are longing for connection. They're looking for all the right things in all the wrong places. There are those, again, that would call out for love and they throw the word around. I love you to this person. I love you to that person. Love is love. But what does that mean? What is love? Love really needs to be defined. And so though the Beatles thought that that message was positive and their manager thought that message was absolutely clear, it wasn't. And of course, the people that embraced the things that were offered to them in the summer of love and the love-ins that followed the year after and the year after that, they were left emptier than they came. They were left feeling as though they were lied to because they were. Listen, every New Testament author writes about love. And no New Testament author writes more about love than John. John wrote a ton about love. When it comes to the phrase, love one another, it's written 13 times in the New Testament. But John writes that phrase 10 times. Notice this in John 13, verse 34. Let me read it to you. These are the words of Jesus that John recorded. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you. That you also love one another. John 15, verse 12 this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. John 15, verse 17. These things I command you that you love one another. 1 John chapter 3, verse 11. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning that we should love one another. 1 John 3, verse 23. And this is his commandment that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. 1 John 4, 7, Beloved, let us love one another. And 1 John 4, 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. 1 John 4, 12 says, If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. And 2 John verse 5 says, And now I plead with you, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. You get the point? This idea of loving one another is essential. It's how the world knows that we're Jesus' disciples. And I believe with all my heart, it's how we reach a world that's sick in sin and lost and has no hope. It was the fourth century theologian Jerome who was very fond of sharing a story that he had heard from someone else who had heard from someone else. It's in reference to John the Apostle because remember John was the one that was the oldest of all the apostles. And John, who was very, very old when the story took place, would oftentimes have to be carried to church because he couldn't walk anymore. And when they would bring him in, imagine if you know John was brought in to the church. Imagine if he came in to our church. I think John, I mean John who wrote the Gospel of John. John, the one whom Jesus loved, and we know that because he keeps saying that. Right? John, the one who wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. John, the one who wrote the book of Revelation. Well, they were enamored by him. They were amazed to see him, excited to talk to him. And so the way the story goes, he was often asked, what has the Lord spoken to you? Do you have a message for the church? And he would say the exact same thing every single time he was asked. Little children love one another. It's that important that it needs to be said again and again. And we forget. Our heart can be just for ourselves, And so we neglect oftentimes this command to love one another. Now bear in mind, John had a nature just like ours. And John was one that was called the son of thunder 
or son of Bonergus. Bonergus means commotion, and the idea is commotion through anger. And so he had a problem. He had a problem with his anger. Remember, John was one of the ones that had said when a town in Samaria had rejected the message, Jesus, do you want us to call down fire to consume them like Elijah did? Which it wasn't in the manual. I mean, it was kind of a weird thing to say. And of course, Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you're of. In other words, you're not affiliated with me. <laughs> you don't represent my heart. And so John was the one who was called a son of thunder because of his anger. But listen, he was transformed. He was changed. And he became known as the apostle of love because he spoke so much about the love of God and the command for us to love each other. First Peter chapter 1, verse 22, let me read it to you. It says this, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Romans 13, verse 8 says, owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves one another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. Notice this, and if there is any other commandment, there are 613. They're all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 says this, but concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, meaning concerning friendship love. Notice this, for you yourselves are taught by God to love or to agape one another. What's that mean? What it means is this, for this world to be changed, we need to be changed. But if we are going to be changed, there are three lessons that we need to learn about love. And the church in Thessalonica had learned that lesson. But I believe the church today needs to learn this lesson again. Number one, love is who God is. Notice verse seven, love is who God is. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Verse eight, he who does not love does not know God for God is love. Now listen again. Love is who God is. Guys, it's his identity. Now, this doesn't mean that, that love is God. God is love, meaning he's the source of genuine love. If love was God, then someone could say, well, I love my boyfriend or my girlfriend, and that's why I live with them, that's why I sleep with them, because, you know, love is God. Well, no, that's not true. It's unholy. That's not love. That's lust. Or you say, well, I really love tacos, okay? Some have said that, okay? Right? You eat a lot of tacos, that's not love, that's gluttony, okay? It's cheap to call that love. Love is something completely different, and God is love. He's the source of genuine love, deep love, agape love. And remember, we've talked about agape love many times, let me repeat it to you again, the definition. Agape love is unconditional, self-sacrificial decision to give what is needed. And that's God's love. And so love is who God is. When Moses meets God in Exodus 3, verse 14, he asked God what his name is. And God responds and tells Moses his name. God says, I am who I am. I am who I am. The word I am there is haya. In Hebrew, it means to be or to exist or more literally, the becoming one. And the idea is this, that God is what we need and he's always becoming what we need, not because he changes, but listen, because God is before us, he is the one who is now and when we catch up to the need we have, he's already provided the solution in who he is. God is literally every single thing we need. Now, again, love is his identity. It's who he is. And when it comes to names, um, we don't have the same view of names as they had in the Bible. For example, we name someone something because it sounds good. 
We might name something because it sounds good with our last name. Now, my last name is McCormick. It's a very ancient Mexican name. And uh, we have no idea where the name McCormick came from because we're Mexican, but, but that's our name. And so my parents you know, didn't want to name us like Fernando right? or Julio or Jesus, you know, McCormick. It just doesn't go. Right? And so my dad, when he was, when he was born, um, his mom's name was Cruz Pineda, and she had two sisters. And, you know, they were bothered by the fact that, that my grandma married a man with the last name McCormick. His first name was Raphael, by the way. And so uh, she wanted to name her son, my dad, Edward, because she thought Edward sounded good with McCormick. They said, not Eduardo. And no, no, no. She wanted Edward. So when my dad was born, my, my grandma almost died, and she was in a coma for a few days. And um, these two sisters, who were just kind of nosy, pushy sisters, they decided to take uh, matters in their own hands. And so they named my dad, each of them. And somehow, my dad ended up having three social security cards. So when he joined the military, you know, he didn't have a middle name. And so they asked him what his name was, Edward McCormick. And so they gave him P for Pineda, you know, my, my, uh, um, my grandma's maiden name. And so he became known as Edward P. McCormick. When he retired at about 65 years old and he went to collect Social Security, they said, you don't exist. And so they were wrestling with trying to find out, you know, where his name was. And somehow that Social Security number got lost or someone stole it or whatever. And so they said, your name is actually Fernando. So then they looked further and they found out your name is Ramon. Because those two sisters, Ramon McCormick, Fernando McCormick. And so until the day my dad died, we would joke with him all the time. You know, he'd say something. What's that, Ramon? (laughs) Was that for Fernando? Okay, it doesn't fit, okay? It doesn't match. We name names because it fits. You know, in Utah, you name names because it looks good on the writing. So Brian, for example, might be in Utah, B-R-X-Y-U-A-N-N with a bunch of silent consonants, right? In the Bible, the names were their character. So when somebody had a character trait, or something attached that was an experience that became their name. Like Moses means from the water because he was drawn from the water. Abram means father, right, of a multitude. Abraham, father of many nations, are exalted. So many, many kids, okay? Jacob, who was a ripoff, his name means dirty, sneaky thief. Esau, his name means, anybody remember what his name means? What is it? Say it loud. Harry. Why? Because he was really, really hairy. Okay. Proverbs 22.1 says, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. It's not just talking about what you name your children. It's the character. The name is the character that they adopt. Listen, God's identity According to this passage here is love. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. It's important to remember. And remember, love is an unconditional, self-sacrificial decision to give what is needed. And here's why we're emphasizing this so much, because God's name literally, okay, as we would say, it would be Yahweh. You might see it sometimes in the Bible as Y-H-W-H, with the vowels removed, because they so respected God's name, they didn't want to pronounce his name in their mind. And so those vowels are lost. It could be Yahweh. It could be Yehovah. But his names are compound names, oftentimes in the Old Testament, that attach this idea of the becoming one, Yahweh, with a character trait. For example, in Genesis 16, verse 13, he is Yahweh El Roy. Yahweh El Roy. Beautiful name. It means the Lord who sees. Because remember, that woman who was alone in the wilderness, she felt like she was forgotten. She was by herself, but God was there. 
God saw her. He encouraged her. And she called the place, right? Yehovah El Roy, for you are the God who sees me. I love that. You might feel like everybody misses you. And frankly, maybe they do miss you, meaning they don't see you. Maybe they forget you. It's possible. You could be unseen. You could be forgotten. You could be excluded. That's possible. But not by God. God sees you. And if that's what you need, listen, you're never alone. In Genesis 22, verse 14, Abraham exclaims about God that he is Jehovah Yaira. He is the God who provides. In Exodus 15, verse 26, we see that he is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. And he is the God who heals. He still heals today. In Exodus 17, verse 15, he is Jehovah Nisi, that is the Lord who is your banner. Meaning this, you need somebody to stand up for you? Right? He's your banner. He's your defense. Anytime you find yourself in danger, God's there. He's there. He's right behind you. He's got your back. He is your banner. And by the way, the scripture says that his banner over me is love. So his love for you motivates him to help you at all times. Okay? Jehovah Nisi. In Leviticus 20, verse 8, he is Jehovah M. Kadesh, which means the Lord who sanctifies. That is, he's the one who's at work in you to make you holy. He is changing your life, setting you apart for good things. And that's an important thing to remember. He sets you apart for good things. He doesn't want to share you with anyone else. He doesn't want you to be defiled. You're set apart for good things. You're set apart for blessings, not for cursing. You're set apart for holiness, not for wickedness. You're set apart. And the one who does it is God, Jehovah M. Kadesh. In Judges 6, 24, he's Jehovah Shalom, which means this. He is the one that gives you peace. And listen, if you're in this room and you've struggled with depression or anxiety, if you've struggled with post-traumatic stress or distress, listen, God is your peace. He's your peace, and he can do for us what no medication can do. He can do for us what no counselor can do. He is the God of peace, and he's come. The one who gave you peace in your soul, so you no longer have peace um, or have war against God, but you have peace with God, is the same one that can give you the peace of God. And so he is our peace. In 1 Samuel 1.3, he is Jehovah Sabaoth, which means that he's the Lord of hosts, meaning he's the one in charge of all the armies of heaven. And I love that. I love that he's in charge of all the armies of heaven. Remember what Jesus said? Do you not know that I can call down 12 legions of angels? It's a lot of legions, right? And they'll come, right? Just like that. Well, our Father in heaven looks at you and your distress or when somebody's wronging you or when somebody's against you, he looks and a myriad of angels look at him. Wait, can you imagine what that sounds like? That's gotta, I mean, that's gotta be awesome, right? In heaven, they, they just move and you hear all that. That's my like angel sounds of, of swords, right? He looks and they're ready. Just like, just say it, right? Say it and they're dead. Do you remember what happened when that one angel, one, went down and killed the Syrians? Do you remember that? Tons of them, thousands of them die. In one night, he was killing them all night long. He's probably bored, right? At first, he's like using his angel powers, and after a while, he's like, <laughs> he's just killing them left and right like they're nothing. Imagine a whole legion. Imagine a whole myriad. Meaning, our Father in heaven loves us so much that he says, whoever touches you touches the apple of my eye. I love that. And so he is Jehovah Sabaoth, you know, the one who is the Lord of all the armies of heaven. Listen, but he has other names. In Psalm 3 3, he is Jehovah Magan, that is the Lord who shields us. In Psalm 7 17, he's Jehovah Elyon, the Lord most high, the one in charge of all things. 
In Psalm 23, verse 1, he's Jehovah Rochi, the Lord who is our shepherd. And he is in Psalm 99, verse 8, Jehovah Nasa, the one who forgives. He's the one who forgives, and when he forgives, he cleanses us from our sin. In Isaiah 44, verse 24, he's Jehovah Asa, that is the one who makes things. In other words, he made you, he can recreate you, he made your marriage, he can recreate your marriage. He made your body, he can bring healing and recreate what needs to be remade. Listen, he can recreate dreams and passions, desires. He can recreate calls, ministries, purposes. He creates. In Jeremiah 23, verse 6, he's Jehovah Sitkanu, which means this, he is the Lord who is our righteousness. So we don't stand on our own righteousness, we stand on the righteousness of God. In Ezekiel 7, 9, he's Jehovah Makeh, and I love this one. He's the God who punches people who hurt you. What it literally means is he's the God who smites on your behalf. In Ezekiel 48, verse 35, he's Jehovah Shema, which means the Lord who is there. Think about that. Not the Lord who is here, the Lord who is there. In other words, you know he's with you. He'll never leave you or forsake you. You know that he's above you and you rest under the shadow of his wings, Psalm 91. You know that he's your rear guard behind you. And you know that when you fall, you fall into his everlasting arms. Listen, he's the Lord who is there, meaning wherever you're going, he already is there. And he's already available for you. Because we know that in Isaiah 43, verse 3, he is Yehovah Shua, the Lord who is our salvation. Yeshua, in the New Testament, Jesus, the one who saves you from your sins. So listen, love is who God is. And remember, love is unconditional, self-sacrificial decision to give what is needed. And he happens to have a name that means, I am what you need. Anything you need, he is the source. And so the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run into it. And so love is his identity. And listen, love should become our identity. Notice what it says here in verse seven, beloved, meaning those who are loved by God, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. The idea being this, we've received love from God, we've been captured by that love, and because we've been captured by that love, now we take upon ourselves his character, and we love like he loves. I love that. And so love is who God is. Secondly, love is what God does. Love is what God does. Notice verse nine. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. So again, love is what God does. Don't miss this. Verse nine. In this, the love of God was made known or revealed or declared to you and me. Here's the example. That God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Now, Ephesians 3 verse 18 says this about the love of Jesus. It describes it as the width of it, the length, the depth, and the height. The idea is this. His love is multidimensional. And every single thing he does is loving. Listen, God's love is wide enough to allow anyone in. Meaning he can reach you know, the dirtiest sinner. He can reach the hardest heart. He can reach the most heady skeptic. His love is that wide. But listen, his love is long enough to catch us. So we can't outrun his love. He's there. Wherever you go, he's there. If you take the wings of the morning and you go to the depths of the sea, don't miss this. Psalm 139 is talking about the speed of light, the wings of the morning, the depths of the sea, the place that you don't want to go, the worst place to be. The Bible says you are there. You're already there. 
And so his love is long enough to catch us. It's deep enough to save us. So it doesn't matter, you know, how deep our sin is, how deep that pit we find ourselves in. His love is deep enough to save us. And listen, his love is high enough to take us home. And so his love, it's what he does. He loves. And listen, love is God's activity. And it's something for us to remember that it's just the way he works. Everything he does is loving. And that's important for us to remember. Every single thing God does is loving. Turn your Bibles over to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. A few years back, I had the, the hardest period of my life, and it just seemed like there was attack coming from every single direction. There were actually nine different things coming against me at the same time, and it was overwhelming. And I remember as I was spending time with the Lord, I was calling out to God, and I said, I know you're good. I mean, I've, I've seen that you're good in other people's lives. I've read about your goodness in your word. I've experienced your goodness in the past. And so I know you're good. I may not feel it right now, but I know you're good. And I went on in my prayer to say this, I know that you're able. I've read about it in the word. I've seen you working in other people's lives. I've seen you work in my life. I know you're able. I have no problem with the fact that God is good. And I have no problem with the fact that God is able. I know he's good. I know he's able. Here's the thing I had a problem with. I have a problem with your will. And listen, in saying I had a problem with his will, then I had a problem with his love. Because everything God does is loving. There's something he's doing in the midst of the thing that he's doing. There's something going on. You see, we know the passage in Romans 8.28 all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. We know that passage. But it's the next verse that tells us what's good. It says, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined. In other words, he knows me, he knows you, he knows everything that's ever going to happen to us. And he's already given us a destiny. He's predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. Don't miss this. All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. We know it. But listen, what good thing happens? Verse 29, he makes you like Jesus. And that's the part I had a hard time with. I know that he's good. I know that he's able, but I don't like his will because it makes me doubt at that time his love. That his love might be for other people and how he might use me, but I wasn't feeling loved. Listen, when that happens, run to Ephesians 3, verse 14. Notice what it says. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Verse 16, that he would grant you, this is a prayer, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded, in other words, your foundation is love. Verse 18, that you may be able to com comprehend. The word literally means to grasp or to grip is the idea. That you may grab a hold of and hold on to with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Listen, Washington Post in an article in 2021 revealed the information from a study that had been going on for a couple of decades. What it shared was that the American male grip force was in essence 98 pounds today. So when tested, the average American male has a grip force of 98 pounds. I share that for this reason, because back in 1985, the average American male had a grip force of 117 pounds. What's that mean? Once again, we see that Generation X is the greatest generation ever. Yeah. Amen. Thank you very much. 
we have a stronger grip than the millennials. Okay? Now, listen. Why the loss of strength? Soy milk. I don't know. Why the loss of strength? You know, we don't know why the loss of strength. What we know is this, though, is that strength can be lost and strength can be gotten. They suggest that maybe it's because more people are working uh, white collar type jobs or service oriented jobs, less people are working blue collar jobs or working with their hands. Maybe that's why. There's other reasons why that might be the case, but the bottom line is this. Listen, you could lose strength, but you can gain strength. And here's why this matters. Because you can lose strength spiritually and you can gain strength spiritually. And what this says here in Ephesians 3 verse 14 is this, that he, that is God, would grant you according to the riches of his glory, listen, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to grip, may be able to hold on to with all the saints what is the width, length, depth, and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. Meaning this, no matter what happens, no matter how the winds blow, no matter how the floods come, no matter who was trying to knock out of your hand, your hand the love of God, hold on to it. Be strengthened spiritually so that your grip is strong. How does that happen? Spend time in the word. You remind yourself of what God's done in the past and know that he won't change, so he'll do it again in the future. You spend time in prayer and you talk to him and you let him minister to you like no one else can. There's strength there that you won't find anywhere else. You worship him and you praise him, thanking him for your blessings and thanking him before your blessings. And that faith is a grip that will hold on to the promises of God because his character never changes. Amen? So listen, there are three lessons we need to learn about love. If we're going to see transformation in our life and we can be a part of transformation in this world, love is who God is. That's his identity. It needs to become ours. Love is what God does. That's his activity. That needs to be our activity. That what we do is love. Like the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 14, that all you do be done with love. And third, love is why God came. Again, love is why God came. Notice verse 10. And this is love, not that we loved God, meaning love isn't defined by our love for him. We love him in response to the fact he loved us, meaning we give back to him what he gave to us. So in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be, notice, the propitiation for our sins. What's that mean? Well, that word propitiation means to extinguish guilt. Meaning our sin sets a fire, okay? And what Jesus did on the cross extinguishes the flames, so he didn't just cover it like in the Old Testament. He extinguishes it. He removes it from the equation. And I love that about God because we can do some dumb things. Our, our sin just kind of takes over and before you know it, it's the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. And now you have more than one problem. You have two. You have three. You have four. You have five. God's not in the business of covering sin in our lives. He's in the business of cleansing us from those sins. Propitiation extinguishes the guilt. So three lessons we need to learn about love. Love is who God is. Love is what God does. And love is why God came. He came to deal with the problem of our sin. And listen, that's why we're here. We're here to, to reach a world that's lost in sin. And we reach that world by loving on them enough that we earn the right to introduce them to Jesus Christ who can do for them what he did for us. The Beatles, they had nice intentions, 
on Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Heart Club Band album, which was released at the beginning of the Summer of Love, one of the songs written by George Harrison said these words, with our love, we could save the world. That's an empty promise. It's not true. For a generation who was searching for all the right things in all the wrong places, the summer of love wasn't the answer. The Beatles' best intentions weren't the answer. Jesus was the answer. And that's what happened. As the last revival that this country has seen took place at the end of the 60s and stretched into the end of the 80s, it transformed our culture. I believe God wants to do that again. But what that means is, is that we need to love. Remembering what love is. Love is an unconditional self sacrificial decision to give what is needed. Sometimes love is speaking truth. Sometimes love is a listening ear. Sometimes love is preaching to sinners. Sometimes love is sitting with sinners. Sometimes love is a shining light in dark places. And sometimes love is being salt in rotten places. Sometimes love is justice. Sometimes love is mercy. Sometimes love is a holy example. Sometimes love is a helping hand. Sometimes love meets a spiritual need. And sometimes love meets a physical or emotional need. Listen, love wants ears so it can speak to them. Love washes feet and love wins souls. And what that means is this, love values people over all things besides God. Listen again, love values people over all things besides God, over our personal preferences. We love people over our constitutional rights. We love people over our political views. We love people over our moral convictions. We love people over our doctrinal positions. Listen, yes, we love people over our doctrinal positions. It does not mean we don't speak truth, but we love them even if they don't agree. And here's why, because our orthopraxy needs to be just as biblical as our orthodoxy. Meaning this, the way we live out what we believe okay, is more important than simply resting on what we believe. We need to live it out. Otherwise, we're hypocrites. And this world desperately needs to see another expression of God's love through his church. And that's what's going to change our world. And God's love is all they need. Amen? Would you stand with me?